this is going to be our first lecture, um, doing the whole flipping the classroom where we're going to watch lectures online. And hopefully when you come into class, we'll have time to do labs, activities, fun stuff, things that like we all like to do as opposed to just lecture, lecture, lecture. And having to wait for other people to make sure they're writing notes, whatnot, because this is all at your own speed. So we're going to start with classification. So before we start with classification, there's a couple of terms that you might want to know. Uh, we have binome tax u archaeo. Yes, I know, these are not in the lecture notes, but these are terms that you might want to write down somewhere on the side because you will see them again. So bi typically refers to two. When you see nom, gnome, uh, ordered knowledge or law. Tax, arrange or put in order. You, well, good, true, and normal. And then archaeo typically refers to anything that's primitive or ancient. So classification. If I had to give a definition of classification, I'd say it's the grouping of objects based on similarities. So for example, I have a bunch of shapes. Circles, triangles, squares. They're red, you got blue, you have white, you have yellow. So one way we can classify it, large shapes versus small shapes. Or let's say we want to go with red. You can go red or not red. Or we can even do color, no color. So something I want you to try uh, before we go any further with the lecture, uh, you have books, cars, sports teams, CDs, stores in the mall, shoes, clothing, movies, pick any topic you want. I want you to try and take a couple of, make a couple of categories, like two to four categories, columns, and try and organize whatever topic uh, you decide to go with. Like, let's say we all know Miss Case. Miss Case likes music. So I could do maybe different genres of music and try and categorize artists. But I want you to put examples in each of those categories. And feel free to stop the video so you can have some time to do this, because you know what? I might put this in your packet. And hopefully you're able to do that whole classification activity. Have any trouble with it? If, it took, if you did, it's okay. Guess what? You'll see me next class. But taxonomy is the biological study of classification. Yes, we like to study things in science, including how we classify things, because we are just that anal retentive. Just kidding. But uh, a taxonomist would be a biologist that studies taxonomy. Surprise, surprise. Uh, and the first true taxonomist, you can say, was Aristotle. Uh, think back Greco-Roman time, people in togas. Uh, he was the first to classify living things. And he put things in two major groups, plants and animals. Other than that, there is nothing, just plants, animals. But then he went after, after he did plants and animals, he decided to classify it by size or even the way that they live. So you might have had some animals that lived in the water, you had some that lived on land, you had some that were in the sky. Very simple, much more, much simpler than it is today. So like in Aristotle's case, bats, birds, and bees were all grouped together just because they could all fly. But we know that they're not actually related. They're not they wouldn't be class, classified together necessarily. So ultimately, not a very good system. There's a picture of Aristotle, the typical like, okay, old, you see him kind of wearing a toga, got his beard, the white hair. Like when you typically think of a scientist, at least the white hair portion, I don't know what it is. But, uh, if you're looking at Aristotle's, uh, his classification, you have living, everything was living, that's the only thing he restricted it to. You had plants, plants, trees, shrubs, herbs, trees, trees with tall plants with one trunk, shrubs were any medium plants with several trunks, herbs are like small plants with soft stems like oregano, thyme, basil, I don't know, pick one. And then you had animal, he classified it by where they live. So he had land, air, and water. Animals that lived in water, animals that lived in air and could fly, and then animals that lived on land. 
So I guess ultimately, like penguins, penguins don't live in the air. They don't really fly. So I guess he classified those as land animals. But Carolus Linnaeus, he is the one who is probably credited with our current classification system. Um, he developed a classification system that we actually use today, the Linnaean system. There's actually the Linnaean Society. Feel free to Google that when you have some free time. But he based the system on how closely related uh, all these organisms were. And he gave each organism two Latin names. Because Latin, Latin is... Latin is one of those like languages that like it's dead. No one really speaks Latin, but in terms of science, Latin is Latin is king. But the whole two Latin name system, we call this binomial nomenclature. So like binomial, like the name, two names, it works. There's a picture of Carolus Linnaeus, kind of happy. Typically in these pictures, they all look kind of sad. But with binomial nomenclature, every organism has a two-part name. Like, we also call this a scientific name, or you say genus and species. Always italicized or underlined, so just going through the mechanics of what, if you were writing a scientific name. And they're always in Latin, which, as I said, is a dead language, unfortunately. <laughs> But an example of binomial nomenclature. So if I'm talking about humans, Homo sapiens, it's italicized. As you see, the genus is always the first, the first name, um, always capitalized. The species, always lowercase. But all together, italicized. And let's say I want to know what the scientific name of a bulldog was, Canis lupus. Granted, all domesticated dogs are of that scientific name, that, of that genus and species. Sometimes you'll have like subspecies, but we'll get into that later. But why should we classify? Like when you think about science, like why is it important to classify different organisms? Well, common names can be confusing. Um, for example, the seahorse. Let's say you've never seen a seahorse before. You're thinking, okay, it's a little horse and you, you can ride it like a jockey. No, that's not the case. Um, another example would be like dolphin. When you might think dolphin as in flipper or you can think dolphin as in the fish that you might be catching on the weekend. I don't know. Also, it makes it easier for scientists all over the world to communicate. One of the reasons why science is able to continue developing and go further and further is because we're able to share all this information with different scientists. And even though Latin's a dead language, we all understand like scientific names. So if I want to talk to a scientist who's over in Russia and we're talking about trees or something, I can say, oh, the, the um, oh, I can't even think of the name of a tree right now. But like, you know what I'm talking about. Um, Oh, how about this? If I wanted to talk about the loggerhead sea turtle, probably my favorite sea turtle in the world, uh, Coretta Coretta. I say Coretta Coretta to a scientist who's in maybe Cuba, and he knows what I'm talking about. Also, classification provides a framework of logic and order. It's all about logic and order sometimes in science. You want to keep it nice and organized. Um, but basically, it helps us also see the relationship between living things. Remember, life is all about everything. Like ecology, when we talked about ecology part, the, that ecology unit, everything's connected, everything's related, and this, once again, is kind of re-emphasizing that fact in science that things are related, and there's relationships that are made. For instance, uh, biologists would have serious problems if organisms were not classified. Like, let's say mushrooms. There are some mushrooms very poisonous. Like, you're going to go in the woods picking mushrooms for some odd reason, pick up one. If you didn't know that, okay, this is of a different genus or different species, hey, you might pick one that might, you eat it, and then you're dead. Uh, and then there's like the Pacific yew tree, which uh, has Taxol, which is a cancer fighting drug. Go look them up if you want more information, because I know some of you guys are like, in this case, I have some questions. Or you can bring those questions in next class. But how are 
living things classified? Well, organisms are broken down into categories we call taxa. Overall, they're just taxa, like groups. Um, and maybe you've seen this before. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Uh, we'll probably, next, when you come in, I'll have you guys do a little activity where you come up with a mnemonic device to help you remember the order, because sometimes that can be kind of difficult. So like, let's say I want to classify a human. Um, kingdom, Animalia. Phylum, Chordata. Class, Mammalia. Order, Primates. Family, Hominidae. Genus, Homo. Species, Sapiens. Um, and something that I didn't have on this slide is the fact that we added the domain. Like So before kingdom, you actually have domains, which we'll get into that in our next lecture. But how do we determine these relationships when we classify things? Well, a lot of it is phylogeny, which is also known as the evolutionary history. Um, sometimes it's the development, so how do these organisms develop over time? Biochemistry, so like all that DNA stuff that we talked about, the sequencing, especially because the technology has gotten so much better, we've decoded the whole entire human genome, we're able to look at DNA and use that as a nice look, comparison of, okay, where does this fit in in classification? Where does this organism fit in? And then sometimes we look at behavior. But that is it for today, and hopefully you enjoyed this lecture. And next time we're going to talk about domains and kingdoms. So we'll see you next time.